Well, earlier today, as we mentioned, the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments in a case involving the Biden administration's efforts to stifle constitutionally protected speech that it viewed as misinformation or disinformation. Basically, they didn't like critics having a voice. Now, the case, Murthy versus Missouri, was put forward by five social media users and two states, Louisiana, Missouri, who claimed their speech was stifled when platforms removed or downgraded their post at the behest of officials in the White House, Center for Disease Control, FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security. Now, Dr. Bhattacharya, as we mentioned earlier, was one of those. Now, much of that content, by the way, turned out to be inconvenient truths for the Biden administration. But will the Supreme Court see past the Biden administration's claims and send a message that the First Amendment still matters? Joining me now to discuss this is Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey, who inherited the case from his predecessor and uncovered thousands, thousands of pages of documents highlighting the Biden administration's extensive censorship campaign. General Bailey, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thank you so much for having me on. So, General, tell us, uh, how do you think the oral arguments went today? Well, I'm encouraged. I think that the Supreme Court has recognized the enormous magnitude of the First Amendment violations committed by the Biden administration and also understands that there's got to be a remedy for those violations. At the end of the day, uh, there was a coercive relationship between federal officials and big tech social media. And the, the goal of the vast censorship enterprise from the federal government standpoint was to drive from public discourse any viewpoint that they disagreed with. This is protected core political speech and the very heart of our nation's at risk here. If we don't have a free, fair, and open marketplace of ideas, we cease to have a democratic republic. And we've got to build a wall of separation between tech and state in order to protect that First Amendment right to free speech on these platforms. And that's especially true as we move into an election cycle. Yeah, it's, it's very troubling as the information you uncovered to the extent of this censorship industrioplex that they've put together of, uh, of censoring critics that they disagree with. Uh, but there were some comments made. I, I listened to the oral argument. You were there actually in the courtroom. But there, there sounded as if some of the conservative members or those who line up on the conservative side of the court were protective of the government's right to question and even discourage the media from publishing certain things, including the social media platforms. Well, there was definitely a lot of uh, questioning about whether or not the communication between the federal officials and big tech social media rose to the level of coercion and whether that coercion actually resulted in uh, censorship activity. But that's exactly what the evidence demonstrates. And that evidence was put on in court when we moved for a preliminary injunction at the district court level back in May. Those factual findings are now locked in as part of the district court's uh, preliminary injunction order issued on the 4th of July. So I believe at the end of the day, the Supreme Court's going to be deferential to the factual findings that occurred at the lower court level. But I would also point out uh, coercion is absolutely present. Look, you can see in the emails where federal officials are demanding removal of certain posts, certain content, and then demanding that the big tech change its censorship algorithms. And you can look on the back end, kind of the ripple in the pond effect, and see, at least when it comes to Facebook as an example, internal uh, emails in from Facebook for it, between their employees established that Facebook changed its algorithms because of pressure from the federal government. That proves coercion. But at the end of the day, you also you don't have to prove coercion to establish state action. You can prove that uh, significant encouragement uh, resulted in, in the censorship, and certainly the evidence rises to that level, or that there's some kind of joint entanglement between federal officials and the big tech social media corporations in a, in a joint censorship enterprise. And I think uh, Justice Thomas's questioning pointed out and highlighted that the evidence supports that as well. So whether or not, regardless of the line of analysis, you use, the censorship was done at the demand of the federal government. Yeah, I mean, to me, when it comes to the First Amendment, the uh, the weight should be in favor of the First Amendment, whether it's encouragement or coercion. If I encourage you to violate someone's First Amendment, I'm still violating someone's First Amendment. And so the government is using these social media platforms as proxies in their attack on the First Amendment rights of American citizens. Yeah, and Tony, I apologize, I'm having a little trouble uh, hearing, but 
but let me say this. You know, if you look at, uh, for instance, some of the questioning by the justices, one of the Justice uh, Kentaji, uh, Kentaji Brown Jackson, one of her questions, uh, op she opined that uh, the First Amendment hamstrings the government's ability to respond to the pandemic. Well, she's absolutely right. I mean, she and I just have a fundamental misunder uh, disagreement over why we have a Constitution. I believe that the Constitution exists to protect us from the government, whereas she believes that the Constitution is somehow empowering the government to respond to, to, to a crisis and needs to be flexible to allow that to happen. It's during times of national emergency that we must be most scrupulous in our defense of our uh, constitutional rights. Without question. That's exactly why we have the Constitution. What do you hope the Supreme Court justices will keep in mind as they deliberate, uh, deliberate over the next uh, f few months? Well, first and foremost, I help, hope they'll keep in mind the enormous magnitude of the violations here. Again, it's not just the speakers who were specifically silenced. It's anyone who would have heard the message that the speakers were trying to deliver. And thus, anyone who's received any information from big tech social media is negatively impacted by these First Amendment violations on behalf of the, the, the federal government. I would also point out that the harm is ongoing. People are self-censoring. They're less likely yeah. to talk about President yeah. Trump, election integrity, or COVID tyranny for fear of being booted off the platform. So Americans yeah. are still suffering under this oppressive regime. So, so true. So true. And that's why this case is so important. And I appreciate you uh, pressing this case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, General Bailey, good to see you today. Thanks for, uh, for joining us. Thank you, sir.